So, uh, welcome everybody and my name is Bernadette Sirikoski and I work at the Victorian Institute of Sport. And uh, a little bit of background for you on me is uh, basically teacher trained um, and worked in a variety of different education settings, primary, secondary schools, universities, a system authority and for the last 15, 16 years at the Victorian Institute of Sport as the Personal Excellence Coordinator which was previously called the Athlete Career and Education Program. So basically, when your athletes proceed to the VIS, they'll have access to a range of um, different support systems. So sports medicine, sports uh, science, physical preparation, sports nutrition, um, sports psychology, massage, strength and conditioning, physical, I did say that, um, and athlete career and education. So it's a holistic group of professionals working around the athletes. So hopefully in a few years time or soon we'll see your young males and females, sons and daughters coming through the program, which will be very exciting. So today's um, opportunity is really just, uh, just to share some thoughts about supporting you as significant others um, on the process. So just some boundaries. Um, if you have any issues with your coaches or with particular um, scenarios, uh, we're not, it, this is not the forum to share that. It's really just some general principles for, for you. <coughs> I'm happy to talk to you privately at the end if you wish. Um, but uh, yeah, just be mindful that it's a generic session on supporting you as parents of athletes, okay? So we don't want someone sharing a long story about um, their personal vendetta about a bad coach. It's just not the, not the timing for this this morning. So um, the session aim, uh, just to increase your understanding of the high performance environment, um, to help you to sort of think about some um, effective communication strategies for your young person and um, understanding your role um, in what you do. Um, and I'm sure you're all doing an absolutely wonderful job, which is not easy. Um, a great challenge for you as your athletes, but congratulations already to what they've achieved to get to this point in time. Obviously, you're, they're certainly on the high performance um, journey, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So it's actually a fairly critical time that your guys are at and um, we have, I, I've worked with thousands of athletes now in the 16 years, we've had four, four to five hundred athletes on scholarship. So um, I can share with you that it's not an easy journey. Every, every individual family situation is different, every young person is different. So it's about um, just working to meet your and their needs. So just personal excellence uh, evolved. It's an AIS um, initiative which developed out of the Athlete Career and Education Program. So what we're wanting our athletes to be is um, to be good decision makers. And these are the principles around that um, professionalism, accountability, resilience, integrity and responsibility. Um, working with their dual career, their sport, their life, um, managing and uh, progression through the pathways. So in the media over the last couple of months you would have seen a lot of information about athletes transitioning and the dilemmas associated with athletes at that time. And um, interestingly we were, I just did a board presentation to the VIS board about what we offer for athletes. And basically I just said to the board, what we do is when the athlete walks in the door, we start with the athlete then. We don't think about transition when it's time. We work with the athlete for that number of years that they're with us. So you need to be thinking about athlete transition and your, for your young person now and what's in place now for the time when they don't continue with their sport at the elite level. Does that make sense? Because if they don't have anything alternative in their life, their transition is harder. It's just common sense. Any, any philosophy, you know, David Parkin, the philosopher David Parkin would say, 
Any individual that is single focused in their life is a danger to themselves and, not in, and also into society because when that one thing goes in their life, there's nothing else. So addictions happen, um, dilemmas, problems arise because that one thing. Now, m most of our guys, and I'm not sure, yours some may have some sponsorships, but most of our athletes are not fully professional, really. I mean, certainly Catherine Freeman and your very senior athletics athletes say, you know, there's a small percentage of track and fieldies who do earn enough to make a living. But a lot of those guys I'm working with, they're studying as well. You know, they might be travelling to Europe and spending a lot of time. Some of them have got sponsorships and they've got their NAS funding, but, um, you know, they, they are studying or working. So for your young people, it's really critical that they actually, you help them develop this, what we call, dual career plan. That's our message. Our VIS motto is success in sport and life. Oops, went the wrong way. Okay, so um, this is really important to consider that what is happening for the young person. So we've got roughly, does that, that red square roughly capsulate your athlete age? Yep, okay. So we're looking at their sporting career developing. And we have athletes right across the range in, in those years. So you think about initiation, development, mastery at the elite level, and then obviously retirement. Okay. Now sometimes athletes will retire and then come back, so that does happen, but generally speaking. So concurrently, you've got your individual's development of childhood, puberty, adolescence, young adulthood, adulthood. Okay. Significant influences, obviously parents, friends, friends, coaches, parents, obviously key partner, parents, other family, significant others. So parents are the stability there. And then what's happening also is primary school, secondary school, tertiary education work, and then um, further professional development training. So this period here, there's a lot happening in a in young person's life. So it really is all about um, balance. And they do say roughly 10,000 hours, 10 years roughly to, for mastery. Roughly, that's kind of generic. So your young people are here, they're sort of, you know, pretty much on the journey, but this is really a critical area here, psychologically and physically, that's happening concurrently. So, um, you know, you throw in injuries, you throw in VCE studies, you throw in all those things, family life, deaths, weddings, you know, all those things that happen, part-time work. There's a lot happening for the young person here, okay? But it's all good, it's all positive, it's all growing, and they're in generally good schools, good universities. You've got plenty of resources around to s support you. So one of the things today is to talk about, you know, looking at resources that are available so you're not feeling alone, calling on those resources when you need them. So, um, there's some really good research happening at the AIS at the moment, uh, which is longitudinally following athletes right through and the factors um, that are happening in their lives. And these, these are the critical ones for your guys at the moment. So um, there are different things happening, what we've just seen on the previous slide, at different times. But for your guys, generally it's managing injury and illness, so VCE and running, what, or their track and field, what, what's the disease that, or the disorder that kicks in in the VCE year when they're just about to do their studies? Glandular fever, right? Immune system stress, okay? So, you know, that can throw them out for a period. So, good health, eating, rest, all those sorts of things, monitoring. 
um, your young person. But you need them to tell you what's happening in their lives too. So you can't sort of guess. You have to, it has to be an open communication system. <coughs> selection, non-selection, that's critical time. Um, and that can be pretty hard for young people not being selected. It can be pretty frustrating. Um, but I think what you just have to keep coming back to is part of the sporting journey. That's, there's going to be times when athletes get injured or, you know, you just hope and pray it's not a career-ending injury. But at some stage, your young person is going to have an injury. At some stage, generally. You touch wood that they don't, but um, it's going to happen if the stresses are there. Um, so, for example, if they're developing a hot spot, you want to make sure that that's managed because it could develop into a fracture. So, if, but if you don't know that, then, you know, and they don't tell you, well, then it's hard. So, you know, those sorts of things are important. Um, selection, non-selection, it's difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, you know that, the politics of all that, and they did this, and then they didn't do that, and you can get very minefieldy, all of that. But, again, you just need to try to um, support them through that um, period. Negative interactions with others in the sporting environment. So, yes, relationships, those sorts of things. Taking sides, I would guard against. Um, not meeting personal goals and expectations. Sometimes athletes can go into a real lull. It might be physiologically you know, associated or health and then they can bounce back. So sometimes there's this sort of up and down period. It's often not just a clear tra trajectory. Um, balancing all aspects of life, study and employment. So when are the VCE exams or year 11 camps or you know, wh how do you choreograph those sorts of things? Um, family expectations, travel can be a big thing, um, sickness and getting used to travelling and being away from home for some of your guys for periods of time can be challenging. They can get homesick. Um, financial strain, relationships outside the sport, training demands. So that's, they're all in a nutshell from the AIS perspective. Um, what are the key factors? Is there any there in your lives that are not mentioned there? Okay. So there's no answers, it's just a matter, it's just awareness really of what is engaged in the process. So um, high performance, high, high pressure and expectations on the athlete, it's an outcomes driven environment and the main objective is performance. So the reality is it's performance based have to perform. So that's the territory that we're in and often selections are based on that and VIS scholarships are based on that, performances. And if athletes don't perform they'll go off scholarship unless they have a major injury and then they would be sustained until they get back to full health. But yeah, it's just a really tough environment, it's just performance based so people need to be aware of that that is the choice that people are making in this environment. Um, multiple transitions can occur concurrently, some of which are in the athlete's control and some of which are not. So again, it's about locus of control. What do we work on? We work on what we can control for the individual themselves. Can't control a lot of things in sport. Can't control the weather, can't control um, technical hitches. It's a lot of things we are out of the athlete and your control. So it's being aware of that. Um, the whole process of becoming an elite athlete, um, what we talked about before, being professional. So all of those things, good healthy diet, plenty of rest, all of those what we call basic one percenters. There's really no, there's no, um, What's the word? It's just sort of pretty basic. High performance is basic. It's about putting all the right steps in place. Um, solid platform, building, listening to all the people who are the experts around, around you, around the athlete, putting all of those things in places, 
limiting alcohol, limiting, you know, obviously no, no cigarettes, those sorts of things. I mean, if people, it's all about personal choices in the end for the individual. And some of you, you don't have control over some of those choices that your young people might make. So if they are starting to make those choices, then there'll be implications for that. But, um, you know, people who are elite performers, there are the basic attributes of um, talent, hard work, commitment, dedication, problem solving, resilience. They're all the common, the common factors. Um, junior to senior, so that's what your guys are sort of going through at the moment, uh, which is very exciting and the opportunities like this camp and um, some international competitions. Um, Athletics Australia and potential state institute scholarships. So I take it your athletes are on the Athletics Australia pathway now, which is great. And then potentially there might be, you know, a state institute of scholarship offer. Um, which is not money, it's services. It's, so just, you, they don't get a wad of cash, just so you know that. They get, <laughs> unfortunately, they get services. So you get access to the VIS facility, gym, training, um, and then all of the service providers that I spoke of earlier. So it's like your gold class um, gym. And you've got all of the expertise, you've got the best sports doctors, you've got the best nutritionists, you've got the best psychologists, you've got all of the best people. So when you come on scholarship, hopefully your athletes will gain all of the experience and wisdom of those people. And obviously the opportunity for growth is there. Some athletes don't take it up. They'll just keep with their own scenarios and um, you know, with what they think is best for them. That's fine, that's their choice, but the scholarship provides offer support. School to university, and then transitions in and out of representative teams. So that's, that's the journey. Um, of course, excitement, friendships, making state national teams, opportunities to travel, wearing the state national uniform. This is what your guys are, are doing right now, which is fantastic. Um, and what, what, we, what you really want is for their talent to be um, utilised. That, that's what you want, is you want, you want to maximise the use of their athletic talent. And it would be very frustrating for you and the athlete if that doesn't happen. So what, what we're trying to achieve is, is the absolute best in performance and around that, um, you know, for the athlete to be happy and healthy and well with a dual career plan, which is their own plan. Um, one of the challenges is that, and you've probably come across this, is that a friend might be vying for the same spot. So for example, in rowing, you know, they might be a lightweight rower and there's a series of um, selections and their friends might get selected over them. I mean, it's really tough, that, that, that very tough environment. Um, very busy lifestyle, managing study, work, sport. Um, the dynamic nature of the environment so that you're in, um, you know, you can be feeling on top of the world one day and wake up the next day and then have a, you know, they can have a virus or feeling down or so, you know, it's, it's incredibly dynamic, incredibly uncertain. Um, things can happen, as I said, out of con your, your control. So, you know, it's sort of like riding the waves, isn't it? It's just sort of um, tumultuous. Um, and then, of course, uh, which is what we'll talk about, is really communication amongst the key stakeholders. So, how can we enhance this communication between coach, athlete, parents, sporting organisation? Because it's, it's very complex. And most of the time when things go wrong, when I look back, it's about communication. And even though we're in a technologically advanced period of time, you know what? We still don't get it right with communications. So, um, all I can suggest is when things go wrong, we need to forgive <laughs> and 
try to clarify in ourselves what are the expectations with others around us so that we're clear. Um, and the greater clarity that you have, then that can help. Because a lot of the times when there's issues, there's differences in assumptions and differences in expectations and I thought this was going to happen and it didn't. And um, So it's hard, it's just hard. So the, the best, one of the best strategies is to have open and honest communications and having those difficult, difficult conversations with people. Um, the reality is, and this is not inclusive of the Paralympics, but the reality is um, that for the 2016 Rio Olympics, that's how many athletes were there and that's how many medals were on offer. That's across the board, not, not just track and field. So the reality is, for an athlete to get to the Olympics, it's an amazing thing. It's very tough. To the, and then for them to medal, like, that's some just an amazing effort as well. So to be an Olympian, you know, the athletes, it, it's just an amazing experience for them when they talk about it. A lot of them just talk about the food court, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, but they love, I mean, it's just, it's just an amazing experience for the athletes who get to the Olympics. To be, to be um, one of the divers, a very funny story, came back from Rio and she's a, she's a sports fiend and she loved, um, Andrew, is it Andrew Bogut, the basketballer? Was he at the Olympics? It was one of those very, I think it was Andrew Boga, let's say it was him. Anyway, she went up to him and asked him if she could have his autograph. And she was so excited. And then two days into her competition, she wins a bronze medal. And he didn't remember, but then he asked her <laughs> for her autograph. He hadn't, she hadn't remembered that he'd, he'd asked her, she'd asked him. Um, so, you know, just funny stories like that and they, they have an amazing experience. The, Olymp the Olympic experience is amazing on all levels, personally and professionally for them. So, it's a wonderful opportunity. But the reality is, some of you may have that experience as a family, some of you may not. Commonwealth Games, fantastic. World Championships, fantastic. But it is very hard to get there. There's a lot of luck, really, in some sense. Um, This point here, choice versus sacrifice. I, some, sometimes athletes will, will say, oh, I've made a lot of sacrifices. Well, that's true and there are sacrifices, but you have to remember that to be in this position, it is a choice. The individual is making a choice to do athletics. <coughs> there are sacrifices that you are making as families, but at the end of the day, it's a choice. No one's forcing anybody to do anything here. So, you know, you just need to remember that it's a wonderful opportunity to be a part of this um, athletics journey. Um, obviously, the athlete is at the centre and you know that you cannot make anybody do anything really. If they don't want to do something, it's, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, we see on the world scene at the moment, you know, if we just happen to pick on Bernard Tomic at the moment, you know, it's, is it the father's dream? Has it always been the father's dream? I don't know, but, and that's a complex scenario, but if the athlete doesn't want to do it, they're not going to perform best. And I'll tell you now, my experience is that the happiest, the happier and the healthy athlete is the one that's successful. So yes, it's about technical expertise and technical performance, but at the end of the day, if they're not happy doing it, they're not going to perform optimally. So that's why the surrounding scaffolding in an athlete's life is so important. Um, time and space. I've just been working with a sailor here at the VIS this morning who retired because he's, he was against the two of the best sailors who are Olympic medalists and his timing in the sport was he was ready to step up in the sport of sailing to the next Olympic campaign and sadly those other two have decided to continue. So he was going to be second fiddle always. So he's decided to retire. So sometimes 
It's, you can do everything right, but just time and space is against you. It's timing in life. So um, he may come back post the next Olympics if, he's, if, he's, um, if he wants to. He's certainly got the ability. And of course, costs and consequences um, can be a major issue. So just in terms of the athlete connection with coaches, um, so we've got the athlete, you guys, and the coach. And um, the reality is the coaches are technically trained to teach your athletes. And I know the coaches at the VIS, because I've had discussions with them, they actually prefer to deal with the athlete. I know that's tough, but they actually prefer to deal with the athlete. Of course, if the athlete is underage, then they would be... So, and yours, how many of you guys are under 18, your people? Yeah, so obviously you have to have that in place. You have to have that duty of care. But as the individual grows, the, the concept is that, you know, this is a really key partnership here, of course, and that is a really key partnership here. Now, sometimes it can sour a bit, but what, what we're really aiming is for the athlete, for you to encourage your athlete to be managing that relationship. I know it's hard, because I know you, you observe things that you may or may not like. The reality is, if you use it as an opportunity to educate your young person about relationships and coach them on communication, then that, that will enhance this scenario. Because this, this, these people have enough to do. If they're really doing their job, they've got enough to be managing. And our elite coaches are managing junior pathways. Sometimes they're representing, they're on international um, committees and trips. Sometimes our coaches are on Australian duties. So, and they've got to be reporting at all of those levels as well as coaching the individual. So they, they want to focus. They've got a talented individual in front of them and they want to enhance their person technically. Of course they're in a family but once you sort of go that next level out it just gets really hard for the coaches. So you really need to think about the life of a coach and what they can technically manage. These are the other areas that are in the pit mix. So the club, other coaches, sporting organisations, service providers, employers, partners, sponsors. So as you can see, there's a lot of stakeholders in this journey. And each one of these has different expectations of each of these, of each other really. So just talking about um, calling on resources for your young person, there are a lot of resources available. And um, if you're, how many of you have got athletes at school? Most, okay. So hopefully, um, there, how many at uni? Okay, one at uni, all right. So uh, which uni? Deacon. Deacon, okay. Um, so schools, schools have good resources available. So if there are any issues educationally, I would be recommend, and I'm obviously with an education background, I'd be going, if you've got any issues, I would be working with the school level coordinator, so the, maybe the phys ed guys, maybe the assistant principal, maybe the principal. You've got plenty of people there. You've also got good career counsellors. So talking about career stuff, you can you work with them. And you might have some good alliances with, um, like some schools, private schools will have um, those vertical people. Um, what are they called? Like a, they stay with the person all through the years. What are they? Mentors, yeah. So they have a mentor with them or a, you know, like they're in a group, like a colour. So they're in that colour the whole time. So they can be really good people as well. So I think, and there's also school counsellors so, so um, university, deacon, so um, one of the things that 
is really good now, which we've only just, well, it's been in position now for a few years, is called the Athlete Friendly University concept. So many, many years ago, we went to the vice chancellors at the universities and said, um, come on, you guys, you've got really good athletes representing Australia, uh, and we need you to help us give them a better go at unis, because you know what universities are like, they're just so big and so challenging. Um, so what happened was, each of the universities in Australia, most of them, all of the Victorian ones do, and most of the universities, you can look up uh, universities on the AIS EAFU, which is Athlete Friendly University, um, just plug that into Google, it'll come up, and you'll see the representative there from the uni. So there's people like me in universities now that help the student. So. Um, some universities like Melbourne University have uh, that if you're on scholarship at the VIS or on other institutes or at national level, so sometimes it's graded, you can get access to the gyms, you can get academic support. So uh, what I'm saying is here is that universities are good, they're getting better and um, the schools, you do have good people. If you come up against someone that sort of just doesn't get it, Later, they don't get, you'll know what I mean by they don't get the fact that your young person is doing this sport, then find a good ally in the school or in whoever. It might be um, their art teacher or their, find someone in the school who you can work with to address any issues you've got. Does that make sense? Because if you get a block, you just creatively go around it, okay? <laughs> Now, most principals are good, and most universities, the higher academics, are good. It's just the people a little bit lower, and often it's, they don't feel empowered to make a decision like the child's not going to be at school for two weeks. They panic because they can't do the work, so then they're going to fail. Does that make sense? So they're not, they're not, they sort of take it as a, the wrong way that the athlete's not there and therefore they can't do their job, which is true. But what you've got to do is you spin it around and say, oh, well, look, they're representing Australia at the youth such and such. Isn't that fantastic for the school? And so what we do is we write letters to the schools promoting that so that we put the spin the other way. And if you look closely at most schools' core values, you will have something like um, achieving excellence or being talented. Or So you just say, oh, look, we're just following on the school core values, you know. And I've always found the personal approach is really good. But if you go in and you demand and say, my little Johnny this and my little Johnny that, well, straight away, you're just going to get everyone offside. So I go in and basically shut up and say, can we have your help, please? This is a great school. Johnny's really performing really well. Can we work together to resolve this? And then they come up with the answers. And you say, great, that's fantastic. So. Just be mindful of your approach to schools about your person because they are busy places and they are under pressure, teachers. So you've got to find that good ally and work with them. And, uh, and as they go through the years, you'll, you'll find those people, I'm sure. Because basically they do want the ath your persons to succeed. Okay, so um, I just thought maybe if you just have a little moment and um, these are the sorts of things that um, can come up. So maybe just chat amongst yourself for a minute and um, who, who, would be, who would be the people that you would talk to if there was an issue for your young person around one of these domains? And maybe just have a chat to... So what's your person doing at Deakin? Uh, zoology. Zoology, oh, okay. Yes. So. Um, is, uh, are they up to the athlete friendly university level? What level are they at in, in uh, here? It's second year. So second year. Uh, is she on the Australian squad? Uh, she was for Fiji. She, she went, went to... Yeah, is she on an Australian squad? Okay. I think to satisfy um, the 
EAFU, you have to be at certain levels. I think it's representing Australia and that sort of stuff. No, I was told there was only 21, so I brought 21, but um, I'll give you mine. You can have mine. No. Yeah. No, that's right. I'm making a little note. No, that's right. You can take it. I've got that. Sure. Yeah, no worries. It's fine. I know it. Um, yeah, so I would. Is she, how is she going with juggling the studies? Um, she's a stress head, but she manages. Yeah. She puts herself very high. Yeah. That's, so she could go part time. Could she drop a subject and take the pressure off a bit if she wanted? She probably could, but I don't think she would. Yeah. yeah. She's, yeah she expects a lot of herself. Yeah, she so does this thing. She, she's very capable. She just works yeah, down herself. So she drops work a little bit. She works casual as well, but she's actually just drops that down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like she's doing well. I would just, um, and I'll mention if, now that you've said that, I'll just mention a few points. Like, you can slow the course down and go part time. You could do instead of four subjects each semester, three. Well, Dee can have three semesters, doesn't she? Yeah. So, you know, you can lighten the load so then you can perform better. Does that make sense? She's been performing well, though, hasn't she? Yeah, well, if she's coping and she's a stress like, yeah, this is what it is. Yeah, she's intelligent. Yeah, well, that's good. That's good. It's interesting area, zoology. Zoology and science. Talk to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's why she's an athlete. <laughs> it's individual athlete. Yeah. I'm just going to write a few things down. <laughs> so, um, So, just to prompt a few things. Um, okay, so we might come back. So I just thought of a couple of things while you were um, having the break. So most of you are in school. So what you can do is, and this is often my work with schools, is to slow things down academically if you wish. So that what I mean by that is, generally speaking, and I'll just talk the Victorian context, you've got general programs in the lead up to your VCE. You've got 7, 8, 9, 10. And then you've got year 11 and 12. Year 11 and 12 is the VCE. So what we can do is do it a couple of ways. We can extend the VCE downwards and go start a little bit earlier. Or if you wish, you can do over three year periods. So instead of doing your VCE over two years, you could do it over three. So um, there are lots of options. And this is why I'm saying go to your schools and map out the curriculum. So, I've just been to a school this week for a young diver who's in, he's in a SEALS program, so he's talented academically and he's talented in his sport. And straight away he was stressing out. He's doing, he's in year nine and he's doing VCE subjects already in year nine, right? So you can see what's happening. So I just went out to the school and said, well it's great that he's doing fantastically, but Let's just slow it all down and can you design the curriculum map so the parents can see what the options are. So they did it and now you've got choices. So he might, it might have just been a hiccup at the start of this year but he was doing in year nine, year 11 studies. Like that's great but if it's not great if he's stressing because we don't want a young individual to burn out, right? Because he could dive till he's 30. So what I'm saying here is work with the schools to map out and seek support, either the curriculum coordinator or the year coordinator, to map out what is best. If, if everything's going okay, great, just proceed. You want them to be academically achieving, you know, and if they're not academically inclined, well then that's fine, they might end up doing a, a VCAL 
a, like a, an applied learning program or do an apprenticeship or whatever. But that's why we work in four year cycles. So our guys now are all planning now, we're map mapping out their <coughs> sport for the next four years, just if everything goes well, and their school and academic program. So if they're at uni, often we'll go part-time uni. But if you've got Olympic Games in your VCE year, that's tough. So that's where it gets really important. You could, um, yeah, just slow it down, because the Olympic Games is not going to change the year, is it? So mm -hmm. we can work around that. So, but we have athletes sitting exams internationally or inter around Australia. So you've got to make the schools your best friends, really, because you need to get them on side to help you. Um, all right, so let's go. Have we got any sort of ideas? What would we do for um, a major family holiday? Well, we've just had a holiday, haven't we, right now. So what do we do? How do we choreograph that? Who do we talk to? Yep. And it would be good um, to give some advanced warning, like, um, yeah, I think anything is in advance, and I would always put it in writing, email, because you've got a record. And just say, oh, look, we're considering a family holiday to the snow for a week. Is that okay? Or, you know, we've got a family wedding interstate in, you know, three months' time. And then you, then you let them know in a month's time, two months' time, and then a month's time, and then the week before. Okay. Um, unable to attend training. Coach, yep. Um, yeah, it pretty much is all coach at your level, really. <laughs> um, this is pretty important, the medical... Um, now, you don't have... I'm not sure what access to medical services you have, but I would recommend that you start to think about a good team around your team, your individual. So a good GP, a good... I'm, I'm not sure if you're into dietitians, but, you know, a good... Get a good group of people around your athlete to make sure that they've got the right expertise. And there will be an Athletics Australia network of people that you can access. You'll have to fund it yourself, but there will be people that you can access through good clinics um, in Melbourne or wherever you are from. Okay, so um, talk to your local people. Um, yeah, it is pretty much all coach. Exams, clashes, maybe uni, it's, if it's a university, well then that would bring in the schools or the unis, whatever. And that's quite a lot of our work. So our, a lot of our athletes head overseas in the middle of the year. And so they're doing delayed exams through universities or they're sitting exams somewhere else. And there is a lot of paperwork to get that through, as you can imagine. So if an athlete comes to me and says, I'm going away next week, can you organise a university? Univ uh, no, I'm not going to compromise our relationship with the universities. So we've got someone communicating now about November exams. So it's all written up, it's all planned, no stress. I mean, sometimes a selection, say for rower who, who may get selected, there might be a one-off and we'll try, you know, and um, sometimes we get success. But generally speaking, no one likes working under that sort of um, stress, really because it affects relationships. Okay, so just moving towards concluding now, um, empowering athletes, we've talked about this. Coaches really prefer to communicate directly with the athletes, encourage the athlete to develop a relationship with the coach and become the main communicator. We cannot understand what's inside that individual's head and unfortunately adolescents are not that great at communicating, are they? So that is the problem, right? So you have to say to them, please tell us, tell me what is going on in your head. Like, <laughs> nothing. So it is, and if, if at the end of the day they don't, well then they've got to carry the consequences. So, you know, it's consequences versus actions. 
It's important that the athlete gain independence and maintain responsibility in all aspects of life. This builds a broader perspective and a well-rounded individual. Homework, housework, driver's licence, family activities and all of that. I mean, we want well-rounded individuals. If, if we attend to every need all the time, we're failing. So please try not to do that because at the end of the day, they're less independent, they don't make decisions, they're more reliant, they don't cope as well. So that's a challenge. It's always a daily challenge, that one, I understand. Do not make decisions on behalf of the athlete. Instead, assist them to take steps to assist them in their decision-making processes. Help them review and understand the different options. Okay, so this is what we do with the athletes. What are the options here? What, what are the, it's simple, what are the pros and cons of each of those actions? Let's write them down. Who does it impact? Um, what would people's feelings about that be? So you just get it all down and at the end of the day, we just try to make the best decision at the best time that we can with the best information that we've got. That's all we always do in decision making. So that is building really good resourceful individuals. We help them through the process. And of course, that can be agonising to do that. Help them review and understand the different options. And sometimes people get so stuck in their thinking or they're so emotionally uptight about something that you don't think clearly. And that's why it's always good to get some fresh air and some different opinions. Um, oh, I never thought that, that I could do that. Or, you know, um, well, I never thought that was available to me or whatever. So getting more people to in on the process of decision making can be helpful, um, but always seek expert advice, okay? Um, provide reassurance once a decision has been made. A considered decision is the best we can do at any one time and it's okay to make a mistake. They will make mistakes. We all make mistakes because we don't know everything. So it's just part of life. And it's always what I said before about if we make a mistake, well, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I am honestly sorry. And we do need to seek forgiveness. Um, assist the athletes to see the bigger picture and gain perspective of situation, the disappointment of non-selection. So, okay, we haven't been selected, but let's listen, let's learn from it. What do we need to do to get to the next step? How can we improve? Seek consultation. Why wasn't I selected? What, what can I improve on? What can I do better? Encourage them to take action to seek their situation, to change their situation. In particular, encourage them to seek feedback from coaches and ask the difficult questions. So if they go, no, I mean, I've seen an athlete wriggle like a child in a supermarket that hasn't got a lolly. I've seen an athlete perform in front of a coach when they didn't get their way, carry on like a two-year-old. And you think, right, we've got a little bit of work to do here. So <laughs> what, what we want is people to think, okay, um, it hasn't worked out you know, what do I need to do? And often your emotion, they're emotional, so you've got to cool down. So emotion and emotion sort of gets going and there's angst, so it's, you know, you might need to have a cooling off period. We'll talk about it later. Um, breathe, you know, all those sorts of things. But you're going to get the tantrums, you're going to get the tears, you're going to get all those things, which are normal human reactions, but that's not the best time to make decisions. We don't make big life decisions when things are not going well, or in trauma, because you're not seeing clearly. Um, maintain open communication and coach and service provider. So if things go sour, it's really hard to come back from a bad, really bad situation, unless you really sit down with people and say, look, this is not going too well. You might need to get a mediator in, you might need to get further advice, but if the situation sours to a really, like that situation, like, honest to goodness, where do you go? 
Um, some athletes may not want their coach service providers to know what they are going through a rough patch. Yeah, that's always a sensitive one. So again, um, yeah, always monitor the health and happiness and mental health of your individual. If you've got any concerns about that, um, you know, it's really good to have a good GP. Mental health for athletes, I mean, we all know one in four in society suffer from either anxiety or depression and athletes, the figures for athletes is the same. It's not any more, you'd think it might be more, but it's actually not, it's one in four. So one in four of these here, one in four, generally speaking, they will be suffering from something. So that's important to consider. So your local GP, um, and again, open communication as a family. If situations ch change, you know, if, you, if the athlete's not coming out of their room and can't get out of bed for a week on end, and you know it's not a sickness, then something's not right. So you do need to monitor um, things. Okay, parents are the main source of support, obviously. Parents' role is to provide a stable home environment. So you're, unfortunately, that's your gig. <laughs> you're, not the, you're not the coach. You are not the sports dietitian. This is your role provide a stable home environment, diet, nutrition, sleep and rest, assistance with emotional <laughs> financial support. That's the gig. Let the coaches and the program managers take the lead. They've, I mean, in Australian sport, there are so many experts now. When I look at these coaching, and it's really become very, very professional now. So at the VIS, we have the best people sometimes in the world that these athletes are working with. So you've got to trust them because they, they know. They've got 20, 30, 40 years of experience. So if you're coming in and you're trying to take over the coach, coaching role, it's going to end in disaster. So let all of that take its place. I know it can be painful. When the young athlete is under pressure, parents can also experience a degree of try to appear calm <laughs> in front of the athlete. <laughs> Avoid fixing the problem for the athlete. Instead, encourage them to be more independent and support them with the decision making. And of course, intervene when the athlete well-being is at stake. So mental health is critical. And there will be patches where maybe your son or daughter may experience a, a scenario of anxiety and depression. It's not the end of the world. It, it can be just managed appropriately and uh, treated and we move forward. It's not the end of the world. So um, just finally, for our action plan, recognise anything observed, stay close to your athletes, of course. Reach out if they need help. If you need help or they need help, reach out to the appropriate people. Um, refer on if you feel they need a referral. Ask the coach who would be a good sports dietitian, who would be a good sports psych maybe to work with. Um, and then, and at school, of the school and uni, refer to those people. Uh, remain supportive. And uh, it requires resilience and perspective. So that's it, folks. Any particular questions? Yes. In the group of professionals who have the VAS, do you have sports psychologists? You do. There are, there are a range of sports psychologists available. They're all, so most of the people at the VIS have done their initial training. So the doctors are doctors and then they've done extra sports, sports, sports specialisation. So the nutritionists have been nutrition, been do general nutrition. You've got Jess Rothwell, who's working with athletes today, I think. Um, so then they do sports, sports dietitian. So psychologists, they'll be a psychologist and then have majored in sports psychology. So they've got their undergraduate qualifications in the field and then extension. Same with the physical preparation people, they've done exercise science and then they've focused in on rehab or 
um, biomechanics or whatever. So, yeah, there, there's there's good networks around there, and you just need to access through your state. Are you all Victorians or? Okay, so there are there's good networks. Net the Athletics Australia have got a really good network of people, so you just need to um, work with them. You won't get access to the VIS guys, but you'll get some of them work in private consultancies, so that you can't get into the facility there, but they're working in other places. So you could start your young people working with a good group of providers and follow them through. But your local GP is a good start person to start with and then link in with these Athletics Australia guys. Any other questions? Good luck. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs>